Welcome to Water of Life Online. We are so glad that you are tuning in for today's message. And you know, here at Water of Life, we believe in having passion for God and compassion for people. And so we're so glad that you're with us today. For more information about our church, from our service times, to the ministries we have available and more, you can check out our website at wateroflifecc.org. And of course, if you wanna stay connected with us throughout the week, make sure you follow us on our different social media platforms. Well, we're so glad that you're here. We hope that God speaks to you, that he encourages you, and we hope that you are blessed by today's message. My name is Mike Crumlin, and my wife and I have been attending Water of Life since 2015. Water of Life has just had a huge impact on our family. And as I think about family, and in recognition of Black History Month, I'm reminded of one of my family members and his impact on my life and our life. And that's my grandfather, James A. Crumlin. In World War II, he was drafted, did his basic training, at Fort Lewis, Washington, and then was sent to Paris as a medic, and then came home. He graduated from uh, law school in Washington, D.C., and then immediately relocated his family to Louisville, Kentucky. In 1948, he sat second chair with Thurgood Marshall, and they sued the University of Kentucky and won that case, allowing blacks to actually go to the institution for the first time. Fast forward a few years later, my grandfather was one of the lead litigants again that sued the University of Louisville and allowed blacks to attend that institution. One of the beneficiaries actually happened to be my own father. My dad was one of the very first blacks to actually graduate from the University of Louisville, given the work of his own father through the legal practice. Later, my grandfather served as the chapter president of the NAACP and in his own circles where he got connected with the civil rights movement, I think there's a picture. You'll see my grandfather with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 1964. They actually planned and executed a march on Frankfurt. He worked with the then governor of the state of Kentucky, A.B. Happy Chandler. What I find interesting is that Happy Chandler later in life served as the second commissioner to Major League Baseball. You might find it fascinating to know, he's also the commissioner who approved the contract that Branch Rickey put in place to allow Jackie Robinson to break the color barrier and be the first black player in Major League Baseball. As a boy, I just knew him as granddad. He never boasted about the circles he ran in. He never boasted about the people he interfaced with. I just knew him and loved him as granddad. I remember as a youngster, I think this is when I was a high school senior, I lived in Maryland, but I wanted to go to school out here in Southern California. And yet I got into West Point, but I turned it down. And my dad, I think, asked my grandfather to take me on one of those long walks. And my grandfather just talked to me about the opportunity, what it would mean, the fact that my dad didn't have those opportunities in his era to attend West Point. Fast forward four years later, I did graduate from West Point. And today I'm quite honored I stand on the shoulders of a guy who's right behind me here. That's Henry O. Flipper. He's the first black graduate of West Point from 1877. I never would have gotten to that story in my life if it hadn't been for my grandfather. My granddad was a man of faith. So you could say, yes, I grew up in the church, but he role modeled for me what it is to be a man of faith. And it stuck with me all my life. So today that we're honoring Black History Month, for me, I want to honor my grandfather. It is a history in the state of Kentucky, but also in American history. It's a powerful story, and um, he talks a lot about family, and he and his wife do see you guys and Water of Life as their family. And um, as a family, a couple of weeks ago, we asked you to give dollars to care for kids. and. Um, they went to Northern Kenya, where they're struggling with drought right now, um, and you got to feed a bunch of kids who we have a video from them that you can take a look at and see where your dollars went. Take a look at this.
It's pretty cool what happens to your dollars when they come together to do something bigger. Yeah. Uh, well done. Well done. Um, so we are, and if you're just joining us or you're coming over from Upland, we're glad that you guys are with us. Um, we had baby dedications over here this morning, so we're celebrating that. Um, but the thing that's always interesting is if, if you're visiting, you're like, why are all these kids up here? What's going on? I walked up and there were just kids running around up here and it was, it was awesome. Anyway, because um, they weren't my kids. So <laughs> but there's everybody else's kids are like, oh, it's great. When it's your kids, you're just like, oh, what, what do I do? Yeah. Now, um, speaking of kids, uh, earlier this week, um, a, a pastor that I follow I posted an analogy, and I thought it was a really good analogy for us to start kind of the conversation that we get into this week, and so I'll preface with that. And then I'll say this, before I go on, I know earlier in the service, if you missed the, our opening, um, Pastor Braylon said something about um, it snowed in Southern California yesterday. <laughs> Not just up in the mountains, it actually snowed like down in the valleys in Southern California. If the internet was ever going to break, it would have been yesterday. <laughs> and it didn't, so what do you know? Anyway, uh, you know, as we jump into this, we're going to launch a brand new series this morning. And that brand new series is around the names of God. But the, one of the things that's always interesting when we talk about who God is, is that usually we have this kind of perspective that God doesn't want to be found or known because he's so distant, he feels so far away, and feels so unfamiliar for us. Now, this pastor that posted this thing said something I thought was worth repeating because how many of you are parents in the room? Anybody, parents, raise children, whether you claim to own them still or not? <laughs> now, when they were little, when they were little and you played hide and seek with them, you hid well enough that they had to come find you, but you didn't hide so well that they couldn't find you, right? <laughs> I mean, you're not that cruel. Or maybe you are. Some of you hid, you're like, I'm done. They're never going to find me. I'm getting some me time, right? <laughs> but listen. When you're in that loving, caring, nurturing moment as a parent, don't you, you wanna be found, right? Because that's the joy when the kid finds you and you surprise him and go, surprise, I found you. You know, you left your foot hanging out behind the curtain or wherever it is that you did so they could find you. And so many of us have this image of God as hiding himself away from us in a place that we can't find him. And I wanna just put this in front of you. If, if God is who Jesus tells us that he is, that he's a good father, good fathers don't hide themselves from their kids, do they? Some of us aren't great fathers all the time. We hide from our kids. It happens. But he is the good father. And Jesus tells us over and over that he is our heavenly father. I mean, he is divine and he is perfect. And what Jesus is pointing us to, and we'll get to this in a little bit, is this idea that God wants to be found. See, what do we know about names? Names until like the modern era really actually usually reflected some sort of desired character in that person. In fact, many people didn't name kids for months so they could learn what their character was throughout time and history about who they were. And God really is no different than that. God's names, the names he chooses to be represented by, reflect his character about it. And we're gonna spend the next week, few weeks all the way till Easter walking through what those names look like, what they mean, and how we should respond to those things in light of how they reveal to us who God is. I'll let you guess, the last name we'll celebrate on Easter is? Oh, come on, people, come on. You're still frozen from the snow. <laughs> the last name at Easter will be? Jesus. All right, we'll work on that. His name's Jesus. And um, <clears throat> see, the thing that Jesus says about God and when he prays, and many of you who've prayed this prayer, you grew up praying this prayer that um, our Father, yeah, hallowed be thy and what he was saying there was, hallowed means holy or set apart. And the thing that we've got to recognize is that for all of time in history, God's name is and should be set apart. It should carry great weight for us. It should carry enough weight for us that it causes us to stop and think when we think about God. In fact, ancient Israel, all the way through much of the Reformation period of, of the Jewish religion, didn't even say the name of God out of reverence and awe. And we'll get into that in a little bit, but really what we want to begin to understand is what did God say about himself? What does God do to introduce himself to the world when people begin to investigate and figure out who God is? I want to pray for us here, and we're going to jump into this. If you want to, you can open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Not too hard to find. Father, we thank you for your presence. Thank you for your presence this morning, no matter where we are, what, what you are doing among us that we be still and let you do your great work in us today. 
that you want to do something to move inside of your kids, these kids, us. You want to change hearts and lives today, but Father, will we stop and recognize that, let's talk about in just a minute, that you are God and that we're not, and we need to be still before you and let you do your great work in us. So right now, we would just stop and let that happen in Jesus' name. Everyone said. Amen. In Genesis chapter 1, we get the story of creation, and we're going to read part of that together, and it's going to come up on the screen, and so um, I'd love for you to read this with me if you don't mind. You mind reading this with me? I know you couldn't remember Jesus' name, but maybe you can read some scripture with me this morning. <laughs> it wasn't a trick question about Easter. I was like, no, really, I don't, this is like, I thought I was lobbing you a softball, but let's read this together. Can you read this with me? It says this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be, and there was, and God said that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the first day. That was so good. It was like just, you guys sounded like the choir earlier. It was good. See, here's the thing that's interesting. When you read Genesis 1, God said, God saw, God called. And here's the thing you need to understand and we need to understand that God is personal. And we'll get to that in a second. But here's what you got to know, that God speaks, God sees, and God calls. And he does those things for you and for me and for us, for people for all time. This isn't just an isolated moment or, and somebody, I know you're sitting there like, God doesn't see me. I'm going to say this, he sees you, he formed you, he knitted you. And I just, I know that's a little heavy to start with, but I want to lean in here for just a second because some of you discount all these things as for somebody else, but not for you. And they were for you. Because if it wasn't for you, creation wouldn't be the story that is told. Now, the name that God uses to introduce himself is Elohim. It's how he chooses to introduce himself to people. It's the very first name in Hebrew that is assigned to God. Now, it's not a Hebrew word. And so just do a little bit of backstory for you. Now, in the ancient Near East literature, the Semitic language influenced all kinds of different languages. So the Hebrew language is influenced by Semitic language. So El or Elohim, the plural version is Elohim. El actually is the name of God. It's just God, or in fact, God's plural is the name that they would be familiar with. So God adopts a name that is familiar for the other gods, but then immediately changes the language. Okay, get this. And so do the writers of the Old Testament. They change the language to reflect the character of God, that it's, not, it's no longer God's plural. Because you remember in the ancient world, many people believed that there was a pantheon of gods, right? That there were just all kinds of gods, and you had, everybody had their own little god, and every country and every people group had their own little god, and they all worshiped the gods. And then all of a sudden, Elohim comes along who adopts this name for familiarity. I don't want you to not miss this. He does this because he is willing to make himself familiar to people. Just like we said, he wants to be discovered. But what we begin to see is that Elohim is acceptable, but it's insufficient for the totality of who God is. And over time, he moves from Elohim to Yahweh. And ultimately, we see him as Abba. And the thing that's so powerful, the thing that's so compelling is that God is doing this for us. But God is making himself available and present. And as he adopts this name, over time, the name Elohim has come to be known as the creator, the powerful one, the one that can't be overcome. The almighty, all-powerful, creative God. But in that moment, he was just making himself available, approachable, by people when he never had to be. I know sometimes you assume this. There's kind of two groups of people in rooms like this and at home, if you're at home because you got snowed in or something. Uh, I've never said that ever. <laughs> it's true. Some of you probably did. You know, you watch people around the country who are at church and are like, oh, you know, it's a snow day. You're all stuck at home. Some of you actually are stuck at home today. That's so weird. Uh, the thing that's interesting though, and you've got to lean into this with me here for just a second, is that so many in a room this size and listen, here's what we know, that there are some of us here that assume that God is for them and a bunch of us that assume that God is not for us. And you don't actually say that out loud. Maybe you do actually. 
But usually we don't speak that out. It's just the way that we fundamentally believe and the way we orient ourselves towards God is that God actually isn't for us, that he's for other people. He's just not for me. Because it feels maybe too selfish or you feel not valuable enough. But I love what we read a little bit earlier, and if you weren't with us for the baby dedication, I was sharing a passage out of Luke chapter two when Simeon says that that I have seen salvation, the one that was promised for all people for all time. Those words are written, those are preserved, those are given to people like us for this very reason. Here's why, because God understands that some of us doubt that he is for us. And if there's nothing else you hear today, Elohim, the creator God, all powerful, listen, all powerful over all other gods. What does he end up saying over and over again? You see this in the Old Testament that I am the Lord, your, there is no other God like me. I am Yahweh Elohim. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord over, listen, everything. And I am your God. I'm the God over all the other gods, but I'm your God. This personal invitation it's personal invitation, but he's powerful and we don't want to miss that. I don't, want to, I don't want to dilute this idea that he's not powerful because this is the paradox that we struggle with as people is that, that God is both powerful and present at the same time because most of us, power is removed from us. It's something we mo- lean towards, but God chooses to lean towards us with his power. And I, and I think we miss that sometimes because power in our dynamic, in our world, in our culture, power tells us what? You were removed because you have the authority to distance yourself. And God says, I have all authority. I'm going to come towards people. So what, what happens in, in history? Remember in Genesis chapter 2, since the garden, God, Elohim has been doing a restorative work, meaning he is continually coming towards people. What does Genesis 1 and 2 say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and void. And here's the thing that we have to understand that that is the beginning. That is not God's character. He's powerful and he's a restorer. And what God doesn't really want is disorder. And the thing that we struggle with is that he wants to take the disorder here and turn into order as well. See, the word here in the form of an empty and void is this tohu wabu word, and it doesn't really mean anything to us, but in Hebrew, it actually means wasted space, a wasteland uninhabitable. So when the, the Hebrew authors are writing down what happens in creation, what they're saying is this, is that the world was uninhabitable and God didn't see that as sufficient, so he brought order and life to a place that was unlivable. And that sound like the story of Jesus and what he wants to do to humans? That he wants to over and over and over and over come back towards us and breathe life into places that are wastelands and that are uninhabitable. Some of you, if I had to ask you to raise your hand, don't do it. If I said, is your life uninhabitable? You would say, absolutely. Or maybe your spouse would, I don't know. (laughs) But look, but look, this is the promise over and over and over from the beginning of time to today is that God wants to take the wasted spaces and make beautiful land out of it. This is the invitation of Jesus on the cross when he says, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because he understood what it meant for God to be at a distance for a moment. Listen, some of you think God is at a distance because there's a lie. A lie that you aren't good enough, that God isn't big enough to reach into your spaces. And I think God today, if you walked into this room, he'd look at you and say, I created everything. I can lean towards you if I want to. And I have over and over and over again. Isaiah chapter 45 verse 18 gives us kind of a picture and we're going to be in Isaiah 45 a couple of times today. It says this in verse 18 says, for the Lord is God and this is pointing back at creation and he created the heavens and the earth and put everything in place. He made the world to be lived in, not to be an empty place of chaos. And And Isaiah quotes the Lord and says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I publicly proclaim bold promises. Do not whisper obscurities in some dark corner. I would not have told the people of Israel to seek me if I could not be found. Some of you, maybe you've never opened a Bible before. You've never ever considered this. Some of you, maybe you've known God for a long time and you ignore moments like this when he says, I can be found. I, the Lord, speak only what is true and declare only what is right. There's an invitation in here. 
And I hope you catch this today. But Elohim, the creator, all powerful God who can overcome darkness and overcome destruction and overcome our bad decisions and our bad living, that Elohim, the one that can knit you in the womb and create life after life, that Elohim says, I can be found. And what do we know about the arc of the story with Jesus that someday Jesus would say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, I came to be his presence. And I wanna just, I want to not miss a moment here for a second and just say this, that Elohim God is and throughout time will demonstrate his greatness, his power. And his power is more than enough to overcome the destructive path the enemy has in mind for people. Some of us, the, the lie that we believe is that God isn't for us. And some of us, the lie that we believe is that there isn't an enemy that's against us. We kind of get split in two here. Some of you know that there's an enemy that is against you, but you don't think God is big enough to save you from that. And some of us deny that there's an enemy that Jesus says wants to seek, kill, and destroy. And we deny that reality because it's unfamiliar to us. And that's actually the exact same problem on both ends. We deny the reality that God is big enough to be with us because it feels too big and too distant. And that maybe this whole spiritual thing is just not something I'm connected to, or maybe it's not real. And then we deny it on the other end and say, well, I like the idea of God. He's good, but I don't like the idea of the enemy because he's what? Bad. And we just don't like bad things. We want to deny bad things and kind of just go la, 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 right? But that's what our kids do. When the three, four, five years old, that's what our kids do. When bad stuff happens, they just go la, 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 la. And the thing that we all know is that when hard times come, that mature people go, they lean in. Mature people don't lean back. They lean into the tough moments and go, I know that overcoming is possible. <laughs> Here's what we know. We love the overcomer story, don't we? The best movies you've ever seen are the ones where there was some problem and someone overcame that big gigantic problem that looked like it couldn't be overcome. That's our favorite story. The problem is for us, it ends in fairy tale and it never becomes a reality. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, just, just hang on. A bunch of you don't think you are worth having your story changed. I don't believe that often I'm worth having my story changed. But yet Jesus comes on the scene and says, by the way, God loves you. He is for you. He's done all these things for you. And God says this over and over again to the people throughout time and history. But the question that God begins to ask, I think that God, the question that God is asking through time and history as we look at scriptures, we walk through this series is going to be this one question. He's going to make a statement. And I think he's going to ask us a question. That statement is, would you look at all I have done? Would you look at all I have done? And will you be faithful towards me in the way that I've been faithful towards you? Would you look at all I've done? You may not like everything. But would you look at the things that I have done? You might not like it in this moment, but you know in the end it's going to be good for you. Would you look at all I have done and recognize that I've been faithful to you since the beginning of time? And would you, for a moment, ask yourself that question? Will you be faithful towards me? This is a question God asks Israel over and over and over again in the Old Testament. One that Jesus comes to say, let me show you what faithfulness looks like. And then he gives up his life for us. You know, John 5.19, Jesus kind of points us in this direction, trying to understand what it looks like for God to be faithful. He says, um, John records that Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He only does what he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will be truly astonished. For just as the father gives life to those he raises from the dead, the son gives life to anyone he wants. Here's the a, here's a point, that Jesus is part of the redemptive process of God taking what was broken, what was meant for evil, and turning it towards good. Turning it from evil and 
turning into something good. Almost everybody sitting here today, myself included, have had something destructive happen that we didn't understand the other side. And somebody along the way said, just hang on because God's going to do a great work. And you're like, stop talking. (laughs) Right? Because in our brokenness and our shortcoming and our pain and our suffering, we can only see this far in front of us. And God is sitting here saying, just by the way, I have an eternal perspective. And my eternal perspective and my character is that I'm faithful towards you. Because what we're going to read in just a second is that God created not out of need, but out of desire. That he wanted to be with people. And then instead, after the fall and after sin enters the world, instead of destroying people, what does he say? I will find a way to call people back towards myself and bring people back towards me. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 goes like this. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image image, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Those are usually the ones that people don't like. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And he emphasized it again. He created them. He created them. So here's the thing. Elohim was acceptable but it was insufficient. Because see what's gonna happen and parents or grandparents, you, you're watching your kids go through this right now. Parents, you remember when your kids first start talking? Ma, 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 da, 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 yeah? If that's all everybody ever plays on you know, the internet, all I'm gonna sound like is a babbling fool, but you're with me here, you remember your kids? Was that acceptable? Was that acceptable? Like when your kids went ma, 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 or da, 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 was that acceptable? Didn't your heart get really excited? But what if when they were 25, they were still going, ma, 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 da, 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 da. You're like, actually, no, I'm just kidding. But let me ask you, it's insufficient for a 25-year-old to go, ma, 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 da, da, right? But there's a journey in that process because mom and dad become meaningful things that express far more than just the words that are in front of them. Mom and dad. And some of you are struggling right now, just hang in here with me because as soon as I say mom and dad, some of you just feel like failures and and you need to stop fear just a second. It is Jesus' job to redeem, not yours. You be faithful towards him, he will be faithful back to you. That is an entire point in this entire day is that God has been faithful all the way through. You be faithful to him, he'll be faithful to you. He'll be faithful to your kids and he can restore your kids just like he's restoring you right now, okay? So just don't check out on me here when I say mom and dad. Some of you, I know it's a really hard thing to process, okay? But listen, when he talks like this, it is insufficient and God's like, okay, Elohim is sufficient for now, but it's not gonna be sufficient forever. Here's why, because it doesn't foster and include the intimacy that God wants to have with people. He's personal. He's not distant. He's not just all powerful standing up in the sky like some of us were taught with a big cosmic hammer waiting for us to fail so he can squish us. Some of us have this picture of God like he's a big character up there in the sky with a big old hammer. He's like, "Mm mm-hmm, I'm waiting. And you live that way. That's called condemnation. You live believing that God has rejected you. That God is fundamentally disappointed in you. We'll get to Easter in a little while, but just remember Easter came to change all of that. See, God creates out of desire, not need, a desire to know and to be what? No. Isaiah 45 verses five and six kind of tease this idea out. It says, I am the Lord and there is no other God. I have equipped you for, through battle, though you don't even know me. Get this. He's saying, I'm still at work even when you don't identify me being at work. That's how big I am. I'm still at work and you don't even know that I'm at work. I've equipped you for battle. This is what he's saying. I've equipped you for battle. You don't even know me. I've done a work in you, even if you don't know me. He goes on and says this. So all the world from the east to the west will know that there is no other God. I am the Lord Yahweh. There's no other Elohim. Then he changes names. I am the Lord Yahweh, the personal God of Israel. 
I am the Lord and there is no other. I create the light and I make the darkness. Some of you are getting uncomfortable. I send the good times and the bad ones. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. And let me remind you what he says in Genesis. As he looks back and he saw that it was what? Good. Some of us think, yeah, he thought Adam and Eve were great until they failed. And listen, don't miss for a moment that God is declaring that he is at work for his good pleasure because he wants to be known and wants to know you. So Jesus gets a little involved in this when it, and this is kind of where we begin to pick up another picture of the intimacy and the personality of God. In Matthew 28, 18, he says that he came to tell his disciple, therefore I've been given all authority in heaven and earth, right? Go therefore and make, oh come on, make, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit. This is where we get the picture of the triune God, right? This is where we begin to see this, that God himself, and this is important, I don't want to miss this, that there, this is kind of where we get this idea of the triune God. Now, some of you are like, what are you talking about right now? You're like, I remember my grandma did this, and I don't even know what that means. So, here, here, let's kind of give you a, a picture of this, and this is a weak and insufficient analogy, so, or illustration, so just bear with me, right? But water can exist in how many forms? not a trick question. It can exist as a liquid, as a gas, and as a, as a solid. One of the only things that can do that. Now there's debate about that, but just go with it because it sounds really good for my illustration, all right? <laughs> but listen, is it still H2O in its molecular makeup? Whether it's frozen or not, you see where I'm going with this? Okay, listen, God presents himself, listen, and exists God is in his person and is in his desire to be known, revealing himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. The problem for a lot of us is that we identify with one or the other. We're like, yeah, Jesus. And then you're like, Holy Spirit. I might end up up there like this, like one day, and I don't want to do that. <laughs> or Father. Father, some of us, we just, we can't even go there. Or some of us had great fathers and we lean in and we go, Father God, and then we're like, Jesus who? Because we have this great orientation, we project all of our earthly expectations on our heavenly father, who Jesus said is good and gives good gifts to his children, who said he is perfect in all his ways. We just sang that song, by the way. He's perfect in all his ways, but yet we sing that, but we struggle to believe it, right? Because we have, as humans, these things we call issues. We have issues. Anybody issue free? <laughs> All the therapists is in the room, they're like, yes. <laughs> Just kidding, I love therapists. <laughs> I've given them a lot of money over the years, so. <laughs> Look, <laughs> I can't believe I said that out loud. That's the thing, stay in your head, Shane. <laughs> oh, I do. I still give them money, so hey. Here's the thing, when we get into the heart of this whole thing, when you deal with this issue of Elohim, this is the name that God adopts for himself. He uses it to be first introduced to the world. So just get this, if you were gonna pick a name to introduce yourself to everybody, what name would it be? That was a rhetorical question, don't answer. I don't, that'd be interesting. Marmaduke, no, I'm kidding. So it's like an Old Testament God. But here's the thing that's interesting. Watch this with, with God. And this is so important that you lean in and understand this, that God takes a name that represented one thing and turns it into a new thing. This is always the way God is. He is redeeming throughout time. He's redeeming throughout all of time. And he started at the beginning of time taking a name that once represented a bunch of broken little things that were controlling people. And he turned into this big thing that created the world and then brought order and then brought hope and then brought peace. And even in our brokenness, he brings restoration, forgiveness, and new life. He starts with old life. And then he ends up with new life. And this is the thing that we forget so often is that God began in the beginning doing this life-giving thing and he's still doing it right now. 
Listen, Jesus promised that. The question for us is what he asked us all the way back those, all the, back at the beginning. He said, I've been faithful towards you. Will you be faithful towards me in the way I've been faithful towards you? And the answer is no, you won't. You failed. Good job. You're human. And then Jesus leans in and says, I'll be faithful on your behalf. I'll be faithful on your behalf. Will you trust me? Because I am good and I want to do a great work in you. See, there's something really critical here as we finish today. I want to walk through something because also what comes from him is identity. We got to start with a couple of hard questions and I'm going to make myself uncomfortable and probably you too. And the first one here under just this idea of him giving identity is first that if we're gonna embrace the identity that God gives us, if we identify him as as our creator, as our life giver, that he is God and we are not. I know we like get in church and we're like Sunday, we're like, he is God, I am not. And tomorrow morning you wake up and like, serve me. (laughs) Whatever version of that is, it's for all of us, right? Here's the second thing. If he created you, he determines your identity. If he created you, he determines your identity. Not yourself, not your mom, not your dad, not your culture, not your obligations. God, Elohim, powerful creator, determines your identity, no one else. Not throughout time, not throughout history, he determines your identity. You know what he said? He said he made man and he made woman and he saw that it was, that meant he saw you and said it was good. And even when you break it, I'll put it back together again. Would you trust me? Would you be faithful towards me the way I'm always faithful towards you? See, Isaiah chapter 14 gives us a picture. I wanna read this to you out of my, off my iPad because, uh, by the way, if I'm squinting today, I've been told that I look like I'm still asleep. So maybe I'm preaching like I'm asleep today, I don't know. but. I had LASIK surgery last week, and so my eyes are like this because I can't see because of the light. So just forgive me. Isaiah chapter 14 is a picture of the, fall, the coming fall of Babylon. It's a prophetic word, but it's a picture, and Babylon is always associated with the enemy in Scripture. And, and Isaiah chapter 14 gives us a picture of what destruction looks like in our lives when we allow ourselves to walk away from the identity that Jesus has called us towards and walk in the path of destruction that the enemy has for us. It says this, how you are fallen and you have fallen from heaven. And this is poetic, just remember it's just Poetic prophecy, so some of the language here is going to get interesting. O shining star, meaning Babylon, son of the morning, you've been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will go to heaven and I will set my throne above God's stars. I will preside in the mountains of the gods far to the north and I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. This is a human problem. You get this? This isn't just a Babylonian problem. This is a human condition. What is the original sin? The original sin is that people wanted to be like They wanted to replace God. They wanted to be equal with God. And he goes on and says this in this Isaiah, instead you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Everyone there will stare at you and ask, can this be the one who shook the earth and make the kingdoms of the world tremble? And this is why a lot of people believe that this is also a picture of Satan, okay? That Babylon and Satan are often laid over each other. This is could this actually be? This is what, what Isaiah is prophesying. Is saying, in your humility at the end of time, when you get humiliated, could this possibly be the one that made all this ruckus and all this death and all this destruction because now you're humbled? This is the picture here. Could it really be the one that shook kingdoms and made people tremble? You get what he's saying here? He's saying, by the way, how could this thing that felt so big now be so small? Is this the one who destroyed the world and made it into a wasteland? Is this the king who demolished the world's greatest cities and had no mercy on his prisoners? This is is the picture of what it looks like in our lives when we choose not to follow the path that he has for us. Here's the beautiful part. No matter where you are on that path, and you know this and you've heard this, no matter where you are on that path, Jesus wants to straighten your ways. Not because he wants to control you, not because he wants to take anything from you, but he has more for you than we could ever figure out on our own. 
And this is that faithful thing. When he said, will you be faithful towards me the way I've been faithful towards you? When we are faithful back towards him, it opens up the possibility for him to have his will in us. You know, Psalm 131 says this, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. I'm not arrogant. My eyes are not raised too high and I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. Meaning this, there are points and places in my life, and this is David right, that I surrender to the reality that you are God and that I am not. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul was like the weaned child that is with me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time and forevermore. A really smart guy who was a pastor wrote this passage to accompany Psalm 131. His response to it, his explanation of it, when he says our lives are lived well, only when they're lived on the terms of their creation. Let me read that again to you. Our lives are lived well only when they are lived on the terms of their creation. With God loving us and being loved, with God making us and being made, with God revealing us and understanding, with God commanding us. This is so good. And responding, being a Christian means accepting the terms of creation, accepting God as our maker and redeemer, and growing day by day into an increasingly glorious creature in Christ, developing joy, experiencing love, and maturing in peace. By the grace of Christ, we experience the marvel of being made in the image of God. If we reject this way, the only alternative is to attempt hopelessly and forthright broken embarrassingly awkward imitation of God made in the image of man and woman like us. Here's what he said. If we don't surrender and be faithful towards God, the only other thing is that we ask God to be faithful towards us with no expectation that God would ever get glory from us. That we would become God and he would not anymore. So here's the thing that we can lean into and this will lead us to what Paul says about creation and Jesus. The Elohim, God, is turning chaos into order. He's creating clarity out of confusion. He's forming life out of nothing. And he is always restoring out of destruction. We call this the redemptive work of creation that is recreating over and over and over. In Colossians 1 verse 15, and I'll finish with this. Paul says this, that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. And everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else and he holds all creation together. It's almost as if the theme of God's story is, look at all I have done. Will you be faithful towards me the way I've been faithful towards you? I'm gonna ask you to stand right now. Just ask you to simply bow your heads as I pray over us as we finish today. So I was praying for this weekend. I just felt like there was something very simple here that needed to kind of put in front of you. And I'd like you to just close your eyes for a second because I want you to just be able to process this as we finish. Some of you aren't really sure when I say things like, we, God has always been faithful towards you. Would you be faithful towards him? You're not sure that he's actually been faithful towards you. You're wrestling with that. You're very uncertain about that. And the thought that came to mind, and maybe this is the Lord speaking, is that your ability and my ability to experience his faithfulness is directly tied to our humility and willingness to recognize his authority and power in and around us first. Some of us don't think God has been faithful because we have been too proud to look around and embrace our position in this life and in this world. We've been too scared and too insecure 
and then our ability. And those of you who are trying to grow with Jesus, let me just say this. If you're trying to grow with Jesus, your continued growth in humility will increase your ability to see his faithfulness at work in you, through you, and around you. See, the story of God begins with Elohim. The all-powerful, all-creator God that is over everything that spun the stars in the sky and created the water that you float in. The dirt that makes up your body. He created it all. And that story ends with Jesus pointing at his heavenly father and giving us an invitation to call him Abba. Father, intimate, close one. And he is all those things. He is creator and he is personal. He is powerful and he is present. He is with you. The Father, creator, healer, restorer, and overcomer. We come before you today and just say thank you for your grace. Thank you for the places we've denied you. You were still faithful. Thank you that over and over again towards people and towards us, you have been faithful towards you and me. He has been faithful. Thank you for your faithfulness towards us. God, today, would there be a a deep breaking inside of us that we would choose to be faithful back towards you because of your faithfulness towards us? Not because you had to be faithful towards us, but you chose to anyway. We're so grateful for that. Elohim, creator God, big, big God. You overcame darkness. You overcame the enemy's desire to destroy. And you came to give life and give it abundantly. And today we choose to receive that life. Jesus, would we receive it fully? Would it change us? Would we live differently today because of your presence in us and your faithfulness towards us? Would we be faithful back towards you? And what you always said, being faithful towards you meant loving others and loving you. So Father, as we go this week, would you give us the courage to live different, to recognize your image in other people's lives as you created them, just like you created us. They would see your face and we would give them value because of what you did in them at creation, not because of anything they've done for us or against us. And in doing that, Jesus, would be your hands, would be your feet. As we go this week, we pray, God, that you give us the courage to be spirit-filled people that walk with courage, expectation, that your spirit will move in power and life in us and through us and over us. And it's Jesus, then we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. If you need prayer today, we'll be here to pray with you. God bless you. Have a great weekend. Stay warm. Well, wasn't that a great message? You know, I say this all the time, but our hope here is that you wouldn't just receive information, but that you would experience transformation. And so we hope that you were transformed and challenged and encouraged by today's message. Like we mentioned, if you want to find out more ways to get connected to Water of Life, make sure you check out our website, wateroflifecc.org. But other than that, we love you guys. We hope you have a great week, and we can't wait to see you next week at Water of Life.